about the 20s, but I would have been about five at the beginning, so <laughs> at the beginning of the decade. Now, I just was able to get my husband to buy a copy of the Pilgrim's Pass. What was very difficult, because he knew that we'd seen it on television. One of the things I'd seen on television, when the group came up, the picture in 1918, the return of the Zionist Commission from Palestine, which bites me in the head, I suddenly saw in the middle of television my father. And since my father died in 1935, age 44, it was very important to me that I should have the record of this. I have, in fact, got the photograph in what is called the history of Zionism in England. Unfortunately, it only goes up to 1929, so I couldn't do my homework for this book. For this book. But in there is this picture of the Zionist Commission, and proudly at the back, I see my father. Now, my interest in Zionism came from my father because my father started the first care and care sod in this country. He was working for the Balfour Declaration. He organized the, uh, the time of the Balfour Declaration with Weizmann and Sokolov. And he organized a meeting with Lord Rothschild in the chair, of which I've got a photograph here, um, which took place on the occasion of the beginning of the Balfour Declaration in 1917, November 2nd, 1917. And subsequently, he was busy setting up the Kerry King Sod, which you all know is really the forerunner of uh, the joint Israel, JIA, JPA, J, whatever you know, the Zionist funds. So I was brought up in this atmosphere with my father going to speak at Zionist meetings with Dr. Weizmann in the uh, 20s, and I have a picture of him in Glasgow. And, right. Now you've finished. Pillars of Fire, most appropriately just then, with the Hebron massacres. And the history of the period, which I'm going to talk about from a personal point of view, because the rest you can read in history books, is really the history of white papers, of commissions of white papers. Because following the Hebron riots, you had the Shaw Commission. Then you had the Hope Simpson Commission. As a result of those two commissions, in 1930, you had the Passfield White Paper. And we begin the period with a Passfield White Paper in 1930, and we finish it with a notorious White Paper just before the beginning of the war. So two White Papers, apart from all the things that went in the middle, like the important Pew Commission, which recommended partition, an end to the mandate, the setting up of two separate states, or on a small one for the Jews, and the holy places to be under a mandate. Right? So these are the sort of political things that took place. But the feelings of the people who worked in the Zionist movement were different. We saw only hope. We saw that this was a great new beginning for a Jewish national home. And let me tell you that in the 30s, we talked about a Jewish national home until the Big Commission. It was a Jewish national home in Palestine. And my first memory is sitting on the beach in Eastbourne with my father telling me about the terrible effects of the Hebron riots. But soon after that, I returned to our home in Hendon and joined a young Zionist society called Halapi, the Golders Green Young Zionist Society, <coughs> in 1930, it must be, 31. And there we met above the Golders Green Synagogue in Dunstan Road, and we used to have interviews. And the inter-debates were with Hashacha, the Cricklewood Young Zionist Society, with uh, Hakerim, the Kensington one. But a particular one I remember very well. It was an inter-debate with a society called Hayatid, Brixton Young Zionist Society. And the people who came from Hayatid were debating with the people from Halapid this notion that there will be no future for the Jews in the diaspora once the Jewish national home is established. So this was the relevant motion at that time. And who was proposing the motion? Well, it was being proposed by a young man from Brixton called Victor Mishkin. It was being opposed by not quite such a young man from Gold Green called Ab Kramer. It was being seconded for Brixton, Brixton by another young man, much younger, called Aubrey Ebat. And it was being, <laughs> on the other side with Ab Karma, was a young girl called Rita Lipton. And so we debated this motion. 
and I didn't have a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> my father wrote my speech, and despite the fact that my father wrote my speech, I was so overwhelmed by the speeches of Victor Mission, particularly Aubrey, that I just broke down in the middle of my sentence, which I was reading. And from that date on, I vowed that I never speak in public unless I knew my subject. So you can judge from today. <laughs> from Halapid to greater things. We went to inter-debates in Manchester, in Glasgow, in Liverpool, wherever there were Zionist societies, and particularly young Zionist societies. Unless you think that the Jewish community of England, which then numbered about 350,000, was full of Zionists, you are mistaken. There was only a nucleus of Zionists. And nobody will tell me the exact number of Zionists who bought the Shekel and subscribe to the JNF, the Karen uh, K. Emmett. Nobody will tell me that because really it varied very much during the 30s. And most of the people who were organized in Zion societies and young Zion societies were really the children of the immigrants from Russia and Poland. On the whole, the German young Zionists didn't want to know that there weren't so many German Jews anyway. But it was the Anglo-Jewish community the old Anglo, the ones who came back after Oliver Cromwell, who were so opposing. And this was a terrible pity, because in 1929, just before Hebron, there was set up the Jewish agency by the mandatory power. And this was meant to be the people in it, not just the Zionist organization, the world Zionist organization, but also the, the people who were Jews, who were non zionists And uh, we can see that they, they called in for this, Lord Melchett, who afterwards, his family afterwards, became very Zionist, but at that time, he wasn't. The Mond family, who married the Redding family, I remember them very well, they were very active later on. And they also had the opposition, of course, at that time, of the Board of Deputies, very opposed to anything to do with the Jewish National Home in Palestine, afraid of what might happen to anti-Semitism in England. It was during a later period that I was involved in trying to capture the Board of Deputies, helping Professor Brodetsky, who became who was the wrangler at Leeds and became very active and afterwards became president of the Board of Deputies to be followed by Jana later on. But there was this anti-Jewish national home atmosphere in the Jewish community. So we worked together in an association called the Association of Young Zionist Society. And there was existing at the same time the University Zionist Federation. For the people lucky enough who were able to go to university, and there were few then, and I certainly didn't go. And in 1935, by then I was on the executive of the Young Zionist Association, the Association of Young Zionist Society. I thought it was very important. I used to go to Great Russell Street, where my father had been. I used to see all these famous Zionist leaders. I used to see Weizmann, Sokolov, Ben Furian. Uh, Beryl Locker, you know, I knew them, I saw them, never realizing how important they were, really, how important they'd become in history, but we chatted. And we used to go after our meetings in Great Russell Street to the corner house in Tottenham Court Road. And at 11 o'clock at night, this young girl would sit down, 15, 16, 17, not thinking anything of being up late at night and going back to Hendon, with Eban, with A. Par a Herman, Ab Herman, who's now the until recently the president of the Hebrew University with, uh, with Jaime Herzog, who was then Vivian Herzog, who came to my house in, in, in Hendon, and uh, with uh, Don Tabor, professor of physics at Cambridge, all these young people. And together we decided that we would form the Federation of Zionist Youth. We thought there was no point in having a smaller, elitist university group. We needed to get together. And why did we need to get together? We needed to get together for two reasons. We needed to have propaganda amongst the Jews to make them Zionists. But above all, we needed to have propaganda amongst the non-Jews. In the interim, we had had summer schools. And one of the great events of the Young Zionist Movement, and I've got a picture here somewhere, it was a summer school that took place in 1934 at Russell. And here you see some famous people, some people that you and you now who grouped together. Slatsky was the, was the president of the time, and Henry Shaw of Hillel House, 
there's, there's Eban here, there's Landy, there are Silmans. I uh, left out all sorts of people, but that's a group at a summer school taken in 1934. The first summer school was held in 1931, and I went to several, and we had lectures, as you're having here front. So the Young Zionist summer schools, Queen's, Queen's Hall dances every year. These were the sort of Young Zionist teachers. But come 1935, things changed. There were beginning of Arab unrest, beginning of feelings, I think, that the Jews the Jewish national home was less important to uh, Britain. Britain, after all, knew that the Jews, once Hitler came, the Jews would be on her side. There was no alternative for the Jews. In the First World War, there'd been Jewish Zionists on the continent, in Germany. The Second World War is an approach. We knew that couldn't happen. Britain knew that couldn't happen. So we suffered from the appeasement policy of Antony Eden. We suffered from Abyssinia. And then at the same time, there was a growing Arab nationalism that we were having to fight in the surrounding countries. Now, you think Arab nationalism. Were there Palestinians in London? Yes, Palestinians in London, the Palestine Students' Union. And who was in it? Who would you think was in it? Not the sort of people we're talking about now under Arafat. The Palestine Students' Union were young Arabs with whom I there were Jews, students come from Palestine to study here. That was it, we were in the Palestine students. And we all got on very well together. But suddenly, once these riots started, 35, the ones that led up to the Field Commission, um, you had quite a changed house. And suddenly, the Arabs from the surrounding countries, not the Arabs living in, in Palestine, which was meant to be the national home, you suddenly saw them in Hyde Park on the platform saying you must put an end to uh, Jewish immigration. Just as we were saying, the need is great. We want Jews to go from the continent to the Jewish national home. This is what it was set up for by the men. And what, of course, we had been uh, within the limits we were working at that time was what the Hope Simpson report reported at the beginning of the decade what the Passfield White Paper reported, and that was that we should work according to the, e e no, it was the Hope Simpson report. The economic absorptive capacity of the country was what was important. Because everybody was saying, you know, non-Jews were saying, but you can't have any more Jews going to Palestine. If you have more Jews, they, it, it's not economical. The, the, the Palestine would be overcrowded. And we were saying, no, we adopt what was said in the economic absorptive capacity of the Hope Simpson report. And it was afterwards overturned, in fact. The Passfield White Paper was overturned by what was called the letter that was written to Weizmann. It wasn't another white paper, but that, Sidney Webb was Passfield. He put an end to the idea of a Jewish national home, the end to the idea of a mandate, until the MacDonald minority, no, the MacDonald Labour government at the time realized, the Ramsey MacDonald Labour uh, realized, that this would be a terrible electoral disaster if they didn't support it at the time, what was going on. So suddenly, of course, you had into Palestine German Jews, not enough. The German Jews had been able to leave Germany quite easily with Hitler's consent if they were able to give a thousand pounds for, for Ha'avara. And this thousand pounds was a sort of capitalist entry into Palestine. But in addition to that, there was the opportunity for labor certificates into Palestine. And it is this labor certificate thing that we were always quarreling with the mandatory power. And of course, during the 30s, the importance of England, the importance of Great Britain was this. We were able to influence the parliamentarians. We were able to go to Parliament, to the House of Commons, and say, look, here is a Jewish national home. Here is the need for children, the need for adults. Please give more labor certificates. Not everybody's got a thousand pounds. And we argued this case, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. There were some wonderful non-Jewish supporters. There was Herbert Sidebottom, who edited a little paper called Palestine, circulated all the MPs. There was Josiah Wedgwood, Wedgie Ben's father. There was, there was a, a surprising number of non-Jews who were very, very helpful. But above all, there was Mrs. Dug sorry, Mrs. Dugdale, the niece of Lord Balfour, who had lots of influence. She became a friend of Louis Namias, the professor of history, 
who are Jewish by birth, but not very Jewish otherwise. And, and, and so this team worked very hard on the British government to see the justice of it. Well, in 1937, things were changing. The climate was changing. The petition plan had been adopted by the Jews, reluctantly by Weizmann, but he thought a Jewish national home in the Little Park was better than the new, no Jewish national home. Uh, Ben-Gurion went along with thinking we could alter it. The man who really opposed it was Jabotinsky. All these people I knew, all these people I talked to. And suddenly I was getting these people to speak in Hyde Park, to speak in Parliament Hill Fields, because by then I had gone on to the Zionist Federation executive, leaving the, the young people behind. And I was then the youngest member of the ZF executive, and I think the only woman member at the time, and I went on with Eban and with Harmon for a while. And there on the Zionist executive, I became chairman of the propaganda subcommittee. And I, this is the, great, the Zionist executive of Great Britain, not the world one. And by this time, of course, Weizmann was the president of the Zionist Federation. He'd been turned out at the t one time as president of the world organization, but he stayed as president of the English one, the Great Britain one, all the time. Well, we went into Hyde Park, we set up Platforms next to the Arab platforms. We set them up in Tower Hill at lunch hour meetings. We set them up in Parliament Hill Fields. We set them up in Golders Green. Wherever there were open air meetings, we were there. And we had wonderful speakers and humorous episodes. And it was very difficult to speak to meetings when the people were coming and going and put the message out. But that was important in England, trying to influence. We used to go lobby the MPs. Well, then in 1937, I applied for a scholarship called the Eshes Chayel Scholarship, the Woman of Worth Scholarship. Every year from 1934 onwards, 33 onwards, there was a scholarship given to a Jewish girl in Great Britain by two men in Manchester, George Rose and Israel Sunlight. And these two men, one gave the money, the other gave the idea. These two men decided, <laughs> you can imagine which one. <laughs> this was decided the Jewish girl would have 100 pounds to pay for her fare and to spend one month in Palestine. So I applied and I had references from Professor Samson Wright, Professor Brodetsky, uh, all sorts of uh, people well known in the science movement. And I was rather disappointed when I brought the Jewish Chronicle one Friday morning on my way up to Glasgow to accompany Professor Brodetsky for the opening of the Zionist Centre there. And it said that the Asher's Carl Scholarship had been won by a girl called Yeti Golombok from Glasgow. <laughs> Very disappointed. And I get to the opening of the Zionist Centre and there were a lot of people there, including the Jewish Lads Brigade and all sorts of people. And Professor Brodetsky makes a very nice speech and he says, I congratulate Glasgow on having the Asia Skiles, Skiles Scholarship awarded here. I hope the London candidate will be more successful next year. Of course, I was most embarrassed and I had to make a speech immediately afterwards, which I didn't refer to the London candidate. <laughs> but the following year, I applied. I was told to apply again, which I did. And so in 1938, in May, April, May 38, I went to Palestine. And when I got there from Venice on the boat, uh, Dr. Weizmann, I found, was on the boat. Before I got there, that was. And when I got there, I found an invitation, which I have here. Mrs. Chaim Weizmann has the pleasure of inviting Rita Lipton to a garden party at Bet Weizmann, Rochelbock, on the 16th of May, 1938. Anyway. And it was in aid of the work of Wietso, but my ticket was complimentary. And there, of course, <laughs> <laughs> so the hundred pound. <laughs> so there, of course, I was in the garden with Mrs. Hadassah Samuel and all these people very active in Wietso, and it was a lovely occasion. But I went to present my credentials to Mr. Charette, whom I had known better as Moisha Shertok, and with whom I had spoken in England on many occasions at the Conway Hall and in Liverpool and all around. And he said to me, Rita, you can't travel around the country on your own. So I said, well, I've got to see Palestine. I can't just see Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I went to the Sockmill building, which is where it is now, in the King George V Avenue. He said, you must have somebody to go with. And this was difficult. 
I expected to go around on these buses that you share, you know. Anyway, I ended up going with an American lady I'd met on the boat, and we went together to Afikim. I was particularly interested in going to Afikim, because in Afikim, the Jewish Chalutzim from England had settled. You know, there were Chalutzim here at the David Eder farm, and they went from the David Eder farm, and the kibbutz they went to was Afikim. You get to Afikim, there's a watchtower, the most important thing at that time, 1938, was to have a watchtower in every kibbutz, right? So we sat up, and there were songs round the, 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 the table after, after the evening meal, and then um, I went to bed in a bedroom the doctor had given up for me, and she went to bed, this lady from America. Years and years later, when Bobby and I were on a visit to Israel for the Jewish, uh, what was it, International Conference of Jewish Jurists, many years later, one of my friends from Hamboddin, Steve Weinberg, came to see us. And he said, do you remember that night, Rita, we sat round the fire at Apple Kim? I said, yes. He said, you know your lady from America, she wouldn't go to bed. So I said, well, what more than I went to bed, I was jolly tired. So she said, yes, how dare I, how dare we put her in the dentist's hut? She had come all the way from America because she had heard there was free love in Palestine. <laughs> to the chief rabbi's house for a Friday night supper. The chief rabbi by then was Rabbi Herzog, and they were living above a dancing studio in the middle of Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> and when uh, Mrs. Herzog, Mrs. Herzog uh, made me very welcome when I arrived, but she said, do you mind if I lend you a cardigan? See, I had short sleeves on, it was hot on the Friday night. She said, they're coming up to lay in with the rabbi after supper, and it won't be very suitable got short sleeves. So of course I did what she said, wore her cardigan, and then she said to me, do you know, I'm used to going to the cinema in Dublin, but she said, since I've been here, there have been uh, demonstrations outside the cinema, because they don't want graven images, films. <laughs> so, so she was having to suffer uh, from certain religious extremism, as other people are now. But underneath, underneath the Friday night tablecloth, you see, just like this, the, the white tablecloth, and, and Jaime, Vivian, was sitting just near me. He started to say, look, look, a picture of me in Haganah. Picture of me, don't tell my parents I'm in Haganah. Well, you know, I think now, tell your parents I'm in Haganah. Now I read history of the period. 10,000 Jews were under arms in Palestine then. 10,000 Jews trained by the British Mandatory Power. Because at that time, the British Mandatory Power were more afraid of the Arabs than they were of the Jews. So these 10,000 were under arms. And whereas in the beginning it was a secret organization, later it became a British government, a British Mandatory Power. Uh, prom promotion for one. And when I visited the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, the British Tommies were offering me uh, cups of Turkish coffee. There was a very relaxed atmosphere. When I visited other kibbutzim, I was visiting the neighbors, the Arabs next door, and they were visiting too. It was a very, some Arabs were very friendly, some Arabs, but certainly British policy was shifting during that period. So I had an amazing time for a month in Palestine. I came back to report to Jewish communities in England and try and get Jewish communities to send the young people to the National Home. And it was difficult to get English Khalidzim to go, of course. But you see, I addressed a meeting in Manchester. And at this meeting in Manchester, I talked about the 10,000 Jews under arms. But I saw the resolution the other day the resolution passed at that big meeting in Manchester at the Free Trade Hall was that this meeting calls on the Colonial Secretary 
to allow large-scale immigration into Palestine. This meeting calls on the mandatory power to allow a higher participation of Jews in the defense of Palestine. So this was reported in the press, and I've got the press cuttings now. That's how I've been able to do it. So this is what we would do, what I did when I came back. I went to meetings all over the country telling them how... I, I even went to Hull where I told them, imagine, imagine uh, in Palestine there are Jewish dustmen in Tel Aviv. Imagine in Palestine there are also Jewish fishermen. Well, of course, the people in the audience in Hull didn't think very much of me saying, you know, imagine Jewish fishermen when there were Jewish fishermen in Hull. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> uh, when we came back, the situation in England was terrible. The worry amongst the Zionists was great. The number of certificates, which had risen to about 50,000 for labor certificates, was being cut. The Peel Commission was dead. The Jews accepted it in the smaller Palestine. The Arabs would not accept it. That was their mistake, in a way. And the British government's mistake, I feel, too. If they had imposed the Peel Commission then, it would have saved a lot of trouble afterwards. But Eden, as I said before, began to see there was nothing to be gained from help for the, the Jewish community. It would be there anyway, if the Germans, in fact, carried out, carried on their anti-Semitic policy. And so, you know, the White Paper, we came to the White Paper of 39. The Paper of 39, as a result of this change of the attitude of British government, was a terrible White Paper. It recommended no partition, no Jewish state, no immigration after five years. In other words, this was the end of the hope for an independent Jewish state. It was also the end of a hope for a Jewish national home because it was going to become an Arab Palestine. Because I must tell you, at this time, we're talking about one million Arabs in Palestine and 400,000 Jews, even after all the larger immigration from Germany. So when the 21st Zionist Congress met in Geneva, it was a terrible Congress. Weizmann, Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion now really head of the Yishu of the Jewish National Home in Palestine, and Weizmann back as president of the Zionist organization. It was a great, great disappointment because during the meeting of this Congress in Geneva, there was the signing of the Hitler-Stalin and you can see pictures in Jewish history books of the terrible faces of despair of Weizmann, of Sokolov, of all of them. What could they do if, if the two enemies like that get together? What can they do if the one's supposed to be an ally? You know, the one who voted afterwards for the establishment later of the Jewish National Home. And so, at this time, we, this is what they said, and I think this is important. When this white paper came out, cutting an end to the hope of a Jewish state, of a national home even, Ben Gurion made the comment at September, this was August 39, one month later September war was declared. When war was declared, Ben Gurion made the statement, we shall fight the war as if there was no white paper, and the white paper as if there was no war. And Weizmann said, what the democracies are fighting for is the minimum necessary for Jewish life. Their war is our war. So, this shows the feeling in England, feeling of Great Britain, Zionists in Great Britain, grown in numbers probably by then. We had to throw in our lot with the Allies. There was nothing we could do but hope for a victory for Britain and France. Nothing at all we could do. We had to do that. But at the same time, there was this dispute over 10,000 children. Would they allow in 10,000 children into Palestine? But no, they wouldn't allow it into Palestine because they wanted to stop immigration. But all right, they would allow the 10,000 children to come here. There was bitterness between the British Zionists and the people who'd given them the opportunity in the first place of having a Jewish national home. The people who'd thought of that for decoration terrible bitterness, terrible sadness, but nevertheless we had to fight together to destroy Germany. I'll finish in a moment after one of the saddest Zionist conferences that I've ever attended. 
It was the Zionist Federation Conference of 1940. And there we were meeting at the Adolf Tuck Hall. And people had come from various parts of the provinces to take part. But missing, who was missing? Leitzman was missing. Paul Zweig, so active formerly in the liberal movement and the reform movement in this country, would be honorary secretary of the Zionist Federation. Paul Zweig had gone to America. People had gone to where they thought they could help. But Weizmann was in England. And he was the saddest man of all. And this is the end of the great, greatest hopes generated by the mandate being dashed to the ground. And this was despair, despair which I took with me, but I had no alternative but to work in the British Civil Service, and people like my husband, no alternative but to serve in the British forces to defeat Hitler. And so that is the sad story before the end of war. And I believe in the beginning, also always believed thought it was a Jewish national home, and he would be happy with a Jewish national home. That was the beginning. Until uh, troubles, the Arab nationalism started, the Arab riots started in the mid-30s, and until the Peel Commission. Then, if the Peel Commission offered a Jewish state, and it was small, the boundaries were very small, uh, he was prepared to take it because the need of the uh, people in, on the continent was so great. So he would have taken that. So Jewish national home was what we were really working for. It was Jabotinsky who had the foresight to say Jewish state. He was talking like that. And he was opposing Britain. And really, Weizmann, who was born in Motl in Russia, Weizmann was really so anglicized, so admiring of Western democracy that it was Weizmann who, who sort of took the British way and thought he could gain by diplomacy. In fact, the only time Weizmann gained by diplomacy was when he overturned the Passfield White Paper in 1930, 31, and he had this letter, really, from MacDonald overturning everything that Sidney Webb had put in this White Paper. That diplomacy won there. Diplomacy didn't win afterwards. It was Jeff. Yeah, sorry, my answer. I'm just trying to understand what is that the concept of the Jewish national government in Palestine was it was parity. Well, I, I, Weizmann afterwards started to talk about parity with the Arabs. Parity. And um, you see, the Arabs... Well, there, there was talk. You see, the setting up of the mandate, there was talk of a legislative council. A legislative council never came into being, in fact. It was... And, and so uh, that really wasn't thought out, because remember, we were very much in the minority in numbers. <coughs> and we were hoping that they would give us the certificates, that we would get people in. But yeah, from becoming the economic absorptive capacity, it really became the political absorptive capacity. It was sad, terribly sad. So they hadn't really, I mean, I'm sorry to assume. No, no. They yeah. They hadn't really thought it through. They hadn't thought through. Who were at the end of the day? Well, you have to go back. You see, you have to go back to when Weizmann was trying to get out of Lloyd George in the First World War, when they were trying to get the, the Balfour Declaration. It was then that the troubles took place. When they were negotiating on the Balfour Declaration, they thought that little Palestine, as they called it, wouldn't matter to the Arabs, because there are going to be lots of Arab states who were going to be created around. And Syria was going to become an Arab state, in addition to Iraq. And a, you see, so afterwards you had Transjordan taken away from the original mandate to go to Jordan. And you had uh, Iraq, instead of the king going to Syria, he, what was his name? He went to Iraq. Uh, not a Faisal, that's right. So you see, so there the little Palestine was going to be Jewish. And the Arabs would have had so much and so many other countries, but, it, but they didn't do it like that. As you know, Syria became a French mandate. So. That was the disappointment. That's why they didn't think it through. Yes. Well, they're saying that the Arab countries were the Arab states. Yes. <coughs> yes. And there was established in London, um, there was the Anglo-Palestine Club, but what was more important was the Wyndham Deeds, the beginning of the uh, Anglo-Israel Association, which became very important. Keeping it under Britain, British Commonwealth, yes, certainly. Any other? How, uh, you, you mentioned Palestinian and... Uh, students being either Jewish or Arab. 
say by about 19, in the 1920s, 30s, what did British, what, what did British students do at university? Were they openly Zionist? Did they keep, I mean, was that not an issue then? There was no feeling of threat from Arabs or from anyone else? No, no there was no there? feeling, not in the early, certainly not in the early 30s. It was only in the middle 30s no. that things changed. I mean, in the middle 30s, in one year, 50,000 Jews went in with labor certificates to Palestine. The, the Jewish, la the Arab labor in Palestine was working happily in orange groves owned by, refu by um, uh, Arab landowners from a uh, other states, other Arab countries, not Arabs in Palestine. Oh. So they were their employers. And then what, was, what they felt was the Arab students felt a great sense of grievance that the Arab landowners who, who were employing them in Palestine weren't paying them enough money, do you see? And the Jews came along and paid them more money but they shouldn't really have been employing Arab labor because one of the great things I felt when I went to Palestine was this was all very different from the sort of idealism of uh, uh, Pinsker, of Achata Am, you know, of uh, the, the Russian uh, immigrants, you know, the new ideas of self-labor, auto-emancipation, and all this was employing labor was quite wrong. So, uh, no, in the, in the universities, uh, there were no... There were university Zionist societies, I've said, but they were the minority. And the Jewish students who went to university uh, were from, probably. Uh, they, they didn't uh, mix as easily in the beginning. By the end, they were more anxious to, to uh, mix with new sorts of people than to carry on their shoulders uh, uh, Zionist causes or even Jewish causes. who wanted to leave Hitler Germany could get out if they had money. Well, uh, they could go to Palestine on the thousand pounds on this Havara. I've got the figures actually. They could. I've got the actual figures of numbers who went. But, but it was, uh, do, you want to, do you want to know the figures? No, provide, what I meant to say, provide the German for what reason. No, what? Passports. No, yes, but what the arrangement was, what the arrangement was that the the, uh, Israel, the um, Jewish National Home would buy goods from Germany. It was, it was a complicated arrangement, but they could get out. But you see, if you take the figure for labor certificates in the period when Hitler was at his height, uh, I think 170,000 certificates were applied for, and 50,000 were given, about a third. Some, a third. I think this was negotiated. What well, you probably know better than me. Yes, I think it was. I think it was. 